Um, I'm gonna, here to introduce Michael Gage, who's going to talk to us about web work, which is a widely used uh, mathematics homework uh, application platform uh, that uh, most people have never heard of, unless you've been to university in the last 15 years. As old as Perl, uh, as old as Yapsi anyway, pretty, pretty old. Um, I, I've actually heard of it before because I worked on a, a product that inspired this, so I'm very interested in this talk. So let's welcome Michael Gage. Thank you. Yeah, there are all kinds of interesting serendipitous things that came up in, in coming here to talk. Um, this is, I've given talks like this a great deal is it to mathematics uh, audiences. I'm a professor of mathematics at the University of Rochester, uh, but this is the first time I've really talked to an audience consisting entirely of coders. Um, if you get bored, I recommend the demo.webwork.rochester.edu site there. Uh, explore it a little bit. There's, I've put up a whole bunch of demos where you can actually get into these courses and play with them as professors. So first of all, what is WebWork? It's a web-based homework checker. Uh, WebAssign, if you're familiar with that, is a commercial version, which started about the same time, and WebWork are pretty similar. It specializes in mathematics and technical subjects, such as uh, physics and so on. It was originally designed at the University of Rochester, and is now actively supported by math and science faculty nationwide. Uh, it's been supported, is, is supported by the mathematics uh, Association of America, and it's received a lot of support from NSF over the last 20 years. We're very grateful for that. So it was designed as an experimental platform, and it's successfully evolved over 23, 23 years, adding new features but keeping a core of continuity. It's, it's still pretty easy to bolt new features onto web work. It's not always elegant. You can sometimes see where the joins are, but it usually works. People have told me it's like building the airplane while I'm flying it, which is true to some extent, but it's mostly worked if you're just cautious. It has a broad installed base of users. Um, over a thousand institutions are listed on our website as having at least tried it. It's moved well beyond the early adopters at this stage, and um, it has uh, features in WebWork which are likely to significantly impact mathematics classes within a short time. So that's one of the nice things about it. It's kind of already installed, so any improvements to this program, and I eventually going to ask people if they'd like to help, uh, will get uh, disseminated quickly because there's lots of people using this thing already. That's the thing that took the longest time. The um, open problem library consists of more than 35,000 problems. Uh, it's been created by mathematics professors uh, you know, all across the country. Um, it's, I think, really pretty high quality because they created these problems for their own students and for their own needs and they keep revising them and resubmitting them and so on. Um, I, I think it's by and large better than anything you can get from the commercial pu publishers. And the open experimental architecture allows components of WebWork to operate separately with other software, including Moodle, Canvas, GeoGebra, all get to all that. So the philosophy from the beginning was that we wanted to offer maximum extensibility and flexibility in designing mathematics questions. We weren't actually sure whether this would work or not. Could you really teach mathematics online? The answer is yes, but that wasn't clear 23 years ago. Um, and our motto became ask the questions you should, not just the questions you can. If you can only answer multiple choice questions and you know, short answer questions and so on, and then you say, well, I can't teach that thing because I can't put it on online homework. Um, that's not the way to go. Online homework should increase the number of opportunities for education, not decrease them. Uh, and I already mentioned the open library. So, uh, open problem library. The key features of online homework in general, and web work in particular, and including Kappa, was the, the students get immediate feedback on the validity of their answers. And that gives the students a chance to correct their mistakes while they're still thinking about the problem. We run this as homework, as practice, not as quiz, not as testing type of stuff. The idea is um, we know you don't know this stuff because you haven't practiced it yet. Go practice it. We've told you about it. And it provides each student with individualized units, uh, individualized versions, and that means that they can help each other without actually giving each other the answers. And actually, that's where most of the learning takes place is when the students help each other understand what's going on. 
Students love the instant feedback. Instructors like the automatic checking. Here's just an example. I'll give you some live examples eventually, but I wanted to start off with, uh, with some of these. Um, here's an example of a fairly easy problem. The, you want to find the interval described by this inequality right here. And the answer is all the points between minus 3 and 7. And here the question was asked like this. And then the student answered minus 3, comma, 35 over 5. But of course, that evaluates to 7. And so when he checks the answer, the answer is correct. It even simplifies it for you. So Pro will do arithmetic for you. So you don't have to. You can, the idea is to concentrate on the mathematics and the important things, not worry about does the computer understand what I'm saying or various other things that we don't want to be focused on. If you make a mistake, so for example, if you put uh, this kind of bracket here, that means that that includes the n.7, which is not true in this case. And so it tells you that the type of the interval is incorrect. If you just mistype something, it gives you an error message and tells you a little bit about where you are. This is the uh, result of math objects, which I'm going to be telling you a lot more later. But again, the idea, originally we would have to ask this question by, you know, enter the end, beginning, uh, the left-hand endpoint and then enter the right-hand endpoint and you know that's that's not the way you do it on paper you'd write this minus three seven so we wanted to get to that so this is just a, a quick look at what the thing looks like uh, what the code looks like for this um, there's a context which is interval that's actually important because if I have three minus three comma seven, that could mean all the points between minus three and seven, or it could be the point in the plane. And mathematicians know, depending on which subject they're working on, which it means. And so the computer has to know that too. And um, the math objects ideas, by setting up the context, parentheses now means intervals and not points. You could set up a point. This is where the math object is actually created. This is a, the thing in quotes here is exactly what the answer is supposed to look like, except that I've used dollar sign A, dollar sign and dollar B, and dollar sign C. These are random um, number generator, which picks, picks points so that it's different for every student. Uh, it's a pseudo random number generator. It's uh, keyed off a seed. Each student's problem has a particular, has this text and that seed, and between those two, it generates a unique problem for the student. The begin text to end text is just printing. And you see that we are using LaTeX here to do, to enter the formulas. This isn't a very complicated formula, so that's not hard. And then down here at the bottom, the answer of value, uh, sorry, the uh, the answer object not only knows that it's an interval, it knows how to union itself with other intervals and various other things like that, um, but it also knows how to compare itself to the student's answer. So this is the instructor's answer here, this is the student's answer, and uh, that's basically how it works. This whole thing, there's some pre-processing that's done, and then it's run through a safe compartment so that uh, really nasty Perl commands and so on aren't allowed, aren't allowed to execute. And the result is to produce um, HTML output or PDF output. You can do both. OK, so the main points I want to make in this talk are that WebWork has made a major impact on math instruction. And secondly, that WebWork is a substantial and interesting software project written mostly in Perl. There is some JavaScript, but it's mostly Perl. 37,000 lines of code, as far as I could determine. And there's 3.2 million lines of code in those problems, like the little problem that I just showed you. Um, our GitHub account is here. You can go look at it for yourself. And again, anything that we do will get di uh, distributed very rapidly by academic standards. That means within a year. <laughs> OK, so here's what the outline in my talk is. It's going to be, um, let's see what we're doing here. Um, sorry. Um, so I'm going to give a short history of web work. Um, and then I'm going to show you some demos. And then I'm going to tell you a little bit about the support community. And again, here are things that you can look at if you get bored. 
Okay, so you go back to 1995, all of these other talks have set up <laughs> this thing really nicely with all the historical stuff. Um, so in 1995, um, Frank Wolfson, in our physics department was using Kappa, the thing Michael was, has, was helped develop. It was one of the earliest technical homework systems. There were homework systems before that, but not many did math. Kappa did math and physics. Uh, he wanted me to use it in the math department, and so I tried. Um, it worked really well for physics problems, but didn't work quite as well for mathematics problems. Um, it was also pretty limited because you could handle only 24 students at a time with direct dial-up to a next computer. There's Mr. Jobs and next right there. So it needs to be better and the question is whether or not we could use newfangled web. So now I need to go into my personal side a little bit here, indulge me. Um, so I was a, a graduate student in Stanford uh, in mathematics during the 70s and I met uh, Doug Engelbart through folk dancing. Um, some know who he is, I'll explain in a minute. Um, he was at Stanford Research Institute, and he was the person who uh, convinced me that the important use of computers, particularly in education, but in general is for communication and not for uh, number crunching. That's absolutely obvious now, but in 1972 it was not. And in fact, four years before, in 1968, he had created what's still known as the mother of all demos. If you're not familiar with it, you should Google it. It's kind of amazing. Um, Doug had invented the mouse. Here's an example of it. I actually got to work with this one a little bit. Um, he gave this talk over the internet on all three nodes of the ARPANET that was available at the time uh, between Berkeley and, 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 and uh, Palo Alto. <coughs> um, and in general, just convinced me that this, this was, might someday be useful for education and it was a communication device, not for solving numerical problems. Uh, eventually won the Turing Award. It came a little late, I think. I don't think, but the people, the in, insiders know about his work. Okay, so, by, so when the opportunity came along in 1995, um, I said, well, all right, maybe we can use Perl and LaTeX and the World Wide Web, which has just started the year, well, the, the browser had just come out, Netscape browser had just come out the year before, Apache server and CGI, and we could put all of these things together and uh, duplicate what Kappa was doing, except on a somewhat larger scale. Uh, also that year, as it happened, the Rochester Renaissance plan for the college was announced, and suddenly, as a result of that, grading every uh, web work assignment for every student becomes a priority, particularly in the math department. Before that, we just done weekly quizzes, but that wasn't enough. So web work, which had been a hobby, suddenly became a high priority for the math department. So Arnold Pizer and I were the people who started it with a couple of undergraduate in, uh, interns. We worked in 1996. Arnie came up with the word web work, which is colliding web work and homework together. And in 1996, he taught the first class calculus. Other math homework systems were starting about the same time. WebAssign started in 1997 at NCSU. Um, E-Grade started in, uh, in Nebraska in 1999. Um, Lawn Kappa, I think, started about 1999. Uh, the Kappa people had realized that, yeah, the Perl and, and the web was the way to go, and they uh, combined a uh, previous project in Kappa to create Lawn Kappa, which is still going and is still open source, as is web work. So by 1999, we had about a dozen research universities using it. It's strange how these things propagate. Uh, I'm a differential geometer, so the differential, some differential geometers started using it. Arnie's a number theorist. Some of them started using it. Doug Ravenel was chair of the department. He convinced a couple of chairs to try it. Uh, that's how things spread in, in, in academics. Um, we won the ICTCM award in 1999. And in 1999, we also got our first uh, NSF grant. Uh, myself, Arnie Pizer, uh, and Vicki Roth, who was director at uh, 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 Center for uh, Excellence in Teaching and Learning at uh, Rochester. She was our evaluator, and, uh, and the three of us were kind of the beginning of the whole project. So, we started working on Web Work 2. This is a GORSE which shows um, these things right here, the files being built, and then uh, so the people helping build them. Here are some of the people who are working on this. Sam Hathaway was an undergraduate at the time. 
Um, David Servone is a uh, geometer who's his chair at Union, uh, at Union College and an extraordinarily good programmer. You're going to hear a lot about him later. Um, uh, Rob Van Dam joined us later. I hadn't realized he was going to be here, but he's here in the front row, so you can, you can talk to him about this. Uh, shortly after that, Mathematics Science Research Institute sponsored us, and this is where uh, we added a bunch of other things. This is where the math objects first got invented. We'd started on Perl 4, which didn't have object orientation, although we kind of wrote that way. Uh, with Perl 5, we could re use real math objects, and that simplified things, particularly for the writing, and also it made it more uniform for checking students' answers. Um, JS Math was created then by David Servone. It's a precursor to MathJax. Um, JS Math was only available on WebWork and on Moodle at this time in 2002. That's where he started fine-tuning this stuff. MathJax now has taken over all mathematics presentation on the web, as far as I can tell. Any, anything you see that's typeset is... So, um, and the Open Problem Library was born then, called the National Prime. A few la years later, American Institute of Mathematics sponsored us. We had an outreach, which we got a lot of people involved. Many of them are still involved. And then in 2009, we got another grant joint with the Mathematics Association of America to, uh, <clears throat> um, to disseminate, a dissemination grant over five years, a million plus dollars. Um, so we had about 150 institutions in 2009. We wanted to get it up to 400 by the end of the grant. Uh, we'd reached it by 2011. Um, and at the moment, there's, again, it's hard to tell because it's open source and not everybody tells us stuff, but we did a Google search which showed that there were 776 institutions that were actively using it in one semester. I couldn't find 2009, but this is one of our early maps in 2011. 2014, it looks like this. It covers the United States. It's, it's uh, substantially penetrated Europe. We've still got a ways to go. And finally, at the end of this thing, um, the AMS, American Mathematics Society, awarded Arnie and myself. Uh, we were honored to receive the, uh, an award for impact on uh, mathematics education. And they said nice things about my work. Okay. Now I can start telling you a little bit more, end of history, tell you a little bit more about um, the web work itself and how it's put together. Um, it's, it's divided into three parts. There's a database which holds the uh, information about, from the students about you know, the answers that they put in, what their grades are, and all that kind of stuff. Um, there's a front end, which is web work two, which is basically what's called an LMS now content management system, learning management system. And there's the back end, which is the most unusual and special to mathematics, <clears throat> which is this PG render. PG is the name for our um, uh, DSL, which, which makes it easy to write mathematics and to check the answers. The fact that it's open architecture like this has made it relatively easy to change things. For example, uh, math typesetting. Um, that was not at all trivial in, uh, in 1995. Um, TTH was the, one of the things that we used first, LaTeX to HTML, which is really meant for translating entire papers and in LaTeX into, into HTML. Um, we used, but didn't work very well. DVIPNG is a nice little open source thing that was made in Sweden, and that will ch uh, change LaTeX into pictures. But on the other hand, you can't rescale pictures. And that's what drove uh, David Servone, who's a perfectionist, to make MathJax, or JS Math first and MathJax later. During all of this time, we produce PDF output, so every one of those things can be rendered either as HTML or as PDF, and that was something we inherited from Kappa. And in the beginning, this was absolutely necessary because uh, complex formulas couldn't be read on the screen in the early days. Now they can with MathJax. But, um, I still find this useful educationally because for homework, sometimes it's great to have it on the screen, but sometimes you'd like to be able to carry it around with you elsewhere and take a look at it. On the back end, uh, again, the database, we started out using GDBM, of all things, uh, and uh, eventually got to MySQL. MySQL didn't exist when we started. Even MSQL was not working very well. 
Um, on the back end, where for the answer evaluation, this has gone through some uh, changes also. At the beginning, we just used the Perl evaluation fu function, which of course meant that students got funny, <laughs> really interesting error messages from time to time, straight from the Perl compiler. Um, we eventually put a little bit of a front end on that algebraic parser, which would check to see whether they had syntax errors, and then David uh, came up with math objects, which is a thing that we currently use. So, um, we knew we were going to make mistakes from the beginning. We knew this was an experiment, so we basically designed it so we could keep rebuilding the thing as we were flying. Um, this is, I think, one of the uh, best compliments that we've ever received. This is an, or I think so, computer-aided assessment of mathematics by Chris Sanguin, who knows what he's talking about. He's uh, designed something similar called Stack. Uh, he's at University of Edinburgh these days. But he recognized that because of the construction and extensibility, we were able to keep this thing going for 15 years. Now that's 2012, we've been able to keep it going even longer. Um, before I got to the demos, let me just show you a quick uh, list of the kinds of uh, answers that can be checked. The answer could be a complex number, it could be a function, it could be a, a function with units, uh, sorry, number with units, it could be an antiderivative. Remember, antiderivatives don't have a unique answer, it's only up to a constant. Uh, true, false, multiple choice, and so on. You can also solve so, uh, uh, ODEs, ordinary differential equations, and again, that's up to solutions of the homogeneous equation, eigenvectors, all kinds of things with matrices, and so on. Okay, um, so now we get to the fun part where I where we see whether everything works, and, and where I try try to go fast enough. <laughs> Okay, so this is what happens when you start again. All right, so down here I have Perl Conference Demo, and you guys can reach this by going to that website, and you can, this thing, and you can, you can get a version of this which you can actually use and write on. You enter as prof A and log in prof A, and you can do it all yourself. So, um, yeah, let me start first. There's a bunch of tools here on the left-hand side. This is part of that front end, but the main thing I want to show you is the library browser. Can you increase the font size? Oh, I'm sorry, thank you. Um, okay. Thanks for helping on that. So, Let's say I want to do calculus. Uh, no, let's do single variable. That's easier. Differentiation. Product rule with trig functions. You can see there's 41 problems that matches that description. Takes a little while for them to come up. And there they are. You can actually test them in the library. If you see one that you want, you just click Add, and up here at the top, you said where the uh, you said where the uh, uh, problems are supposed to go. Okay. All right. So um, let's go back to the homework sets here. There's a whole bunch of them. To look at, I'm not going to be able to call, cover all of them, but I've left them here for you to look at eventually. One in particular you might like is the interval, interval progression, which shows you successive versions about how we wrote that interval problem. So I've entered the answers already, so you can, I don't have to wait and watch me type. This just shows you that you can enter square roots, and it'll check it. This one shows that you can produce a graph. So you're supposed to figure out points of continuity on this, which is easy. If, you know, obviously this is discontinuous because there's a jump there. But students at this level are often trying, you know, focused on formulas, and if something's given to them without a formula, they get upset. So we we give them problems with graphs. Incidentally, these graphs are different for each student, and they're generated on the fly using gd.bm. Um, and incidentally, 
When you're looking at this, at any time you can click show source and it'll show you the source right underneath it. You can also click the editor button at the bottom and, and see what the source looks like. Okay, so this is one where you have to find the derivative. The antiderivative is more fun. So uh, I was going to show that for you at the end here. I, I, so we need an antiderivative, a general antiderivative is just a function that when you differentiate it, you get x to the fourth cosine of x to the fifth. Trust me, this is an answer. But of course, there's more than one answer. So for example, if I add plus five to it, then that's also an answer. And if you're like me, if I were a student, I would have said I would have entered that because sine squared plus cosine squared is always equal to one, which is a constant. And then I prepared to get really mad at the instructor when the computer wouldn't, wouldn't accept my correct answer. So everyone writes programs for themselves. I wrote one that would have handled my earlier self or maybe even my current self. Here's another example of that. Um, the, we didn't have units at first, but the physicists definitely needed units. So this is sides of the triangle. The answer is square root of this thing in meters. And that's the right answer. But again, you don't, I mean, I, I make jokes about this, but it, seriously, also, you don't want the student thinking about, well, what does the computer want? You want to think, what's the answer to this problem? And any correct answer should be accepted. So if you put in 100 centimeters, that should work too. And if you remember the conversion to feet, why, that'll work also. Furlongs. I put furlongs in too. Just, just to be complete. I don't think anyone's <laughs> used it. I had to look it up. But <laughs> Okay. Cubits. <laughs> Cubits, yeah. Right. right. There's, there, well, there's, there, it's extensible, man. You can add whatever you want. Um, this, is, this is actually taken from the original Kappa library. Uh, a lot of the stuff got translated over by Frank Wolf because he wanted those problems and, and uh, he'd stopped using Kappa and was using web work. It was before Long Kappa actually got started. Um, Let's see what else I've got for you. Um, this one I like. I'm not going to show you all the details of it. This is what I call uh, an oracle function, which there's no formula for. But if you put, give it an input, it tells you what the output is. And of course, you're supposed to calculate the derivative. And students say, well, how can I calculate a derivative without, if I don't know what the formula is? Well, of course, you use the approximation by slopes, Newton's quotient. So that forces them to think about that a little bit. Um, or ask their neighbor at least about it. Um, there's two of those. And then the final thing here, just to show you what the extensibility does, um, the question is, enter a palindrome. I don't think there's any other checker in the, uh, that can do it. But of course, it's really easy to do with a computer. And um, you know it's got a standard. It's got two different kinds of palindromes here. And let me show you the source on this one. Okay. So again, load all the macros. This is like tech and so on. This is the thing that defines the PG language. Um, this is the text that gets printed out. And then this is the little subroutine that text that uh, checks it. Now this is a very early version of this. The uh, the ones using math objects are much more uh, sophisticated. And what you do is there was one question here, um, you know, one answer rule right here, one answer blank, and here's one checker right here. And what this is is a little subroutine that takes the student's answer, compares them, gives a zero or a one, and does the error checking. The error checking is the hard part. Zero, checking whether it's right is, or not is, is not hard. Checking whether what went wrong is, is much harder. For hints? Yeah, you had, you had one I thought where it was. Uh, it's already in the theater. You want to hint. Oh, okay. Three pages back. Yeah, the, the, okay. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, let's, let's do that. Yeah. 
Yeah, so here, here's the question I have for you. Looking yes. Oh, um, no, no. JavaScript, the little, um, the little cable? Uh, yes. It, it was. Um, so, um, you went past it. The, it was the one that had the little buttons in the middle. And the oh, 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 the Oracle one. Oh, okay. That one. Um, so, yeah. So, here, here's my question for you. Um, if I'm a uh, student and a slacker and know about Google um, developer tools, can I just uh, type 2.3, modify the actual page text, get the result, and put it back in? No. Okay. And in fact, um, so there on this, this first example right here, you could go read the source code and figure out that there's some JavaScript in there and figure out what the function was. Um, now what happened? Um, but um, um, but this second one uh, approximates the function by cubic spline. And the cubic spline is in JavaScript. And if a student can figure that out, I'll hire them. Well, no, I'm just saying, if they're using developer tools, can mm -hmm. you modify the... N no, they can't do that. Okay. Because this is all client-server type stuff. Is, and okay. so the so checking is all being done back on the back end. I okay. Yeah, I should have made that clear. I can't, I'm not going to be able to make everything clear. So please uh, ask me questions later. OK. Um, let's see. OK. I think that's it for that. So let's go back to these guys. Um, and I'll try and go through this quickly. So the mathematics formulas are written in LaTeX, displayed in HTML pages using MathJax. Um, they can also be uh, presented as an HTML page or a PDF. Um, as I showed you, the question also defines a small pro program called an answer evaluator, and it's this that gives you the flexibility. Most people who think about this kind of thing um, do it in kind of a declarative kind of language in which you just kind of fill in the data and everything is taken care of for you. And unless you get a new programmer, why well, you can't do much outside of the box that you've been put in. Uh, with Perl, we're using basically all of Perl. So anything that you can figure out an algorithm to check with, you can check with it. And because we're running Perl in the safe compartment, we've managed to make, we've disabled things like print and remove the, you know, erase the disk and things like that so they can't get into too much trouble. Okay, so this I'm going to have to skip. There's an original version here. Um, this is the problem. This is uh, the original problem, which is kind of in raw Perl. You can kind of see what it's doing, but you won't have time. But um, these slides are all up on the schedule, and you can get at the uh, you can get at the examples, or you can go to the GitHub and get at the get examples there. There's a little tutorial in the wiki about how these things are rendered. Okay, one of the best things we did was this clean split between front and back ends, and in it allows you to improve things, but it also means that you can just get rid of the front end and you can just use the back end, that PG renderer, which is the thing that's most unique. So this allows interoperability with Moodle, which we've been doing for a long time. And now that LTI has come along, we can do it with Canvas and Blackboard. And I'll show you in a minute, you can also in just embed it in HTML pages, which will allow us to operate, to interoperate with all of these OER text, Libre text, pretext, active calculus, and so on. So one more thing here. One. So this is Moodle. If I click on Moodle, it takes me to a web work problem, automatic sign-on, all that kind of stuff. This was one that was created by um, at, for the JMM, uh, J Joint Math Meetings in, in Baltimore. Um, this shows you an example of a scaffolded problem in which you can't see. I'm an instructor, so I can see everything at once, but a student has to do this thing first. And then once they get that right, they're able to look at the second thing here. And then they can look at the third thing. So again, this wasn't anything that existed at the beginning of this project. This is actually two or three years in the making, but it's kind of just finished uh, you know, fairly recently. OK. Um, more interoperability. So, you don't even need Moodle in the front. This is what the website looks like. 
Let's look at the embedded questions here. Uh, Oh, yeah, sorry, they're right here. I'm that, so I had to go to them. So this is, uh, this is just uh, an iframe in an ordinary HTML page. And it's got, it's got a little GeoGebra applet running inside it, which allows you to help answer this question about what values of the integral will be equal to zero. Um, here's an example that allows you to do integration and so on. Topics of areas between curves. Um, I actually think I have a slightly better uh, version of this thing set up for you in the uh, hands-on section. This is the hands-on section where you can see these things, and there's another example of this thing down here, which I won't go into right at the moment. Okay. So you can embed active questions, and this is the text, the people who are doing OER, they also want to do online homework. Um, they're trying to sell their books cheap. Uh, we and my open math are, uh, and Lon Kappa perhaps, are about the only choices that they have in terms of open source. Everything else is proprietary. Um, but as you can just see, you could embed this in a textbook. Um, I showed you quickly that it interoperates with GeoGebra. The other link, which I didn't get to, shows you how it all operates, interoperates with R. For the people who are doing statistics, that's quite recent. And it interoperates with Sage Math, which is an open source mathematical lookalike, which those of you who do number theory would be, would, would be familiar with. Okay, <clears throat> final part here. Uh, the WebWork project was formed somewhat recently. You can put an LLC after that as of three days ago. We're actually official. Um, it's the support community that works on this thing. <clears throat> it has a lot of the same kinds of, except that we're newer to this stuff, uh, the same kinds of problems that Perl has. Um, we found that code camps, these ha hackathons, are the best way to get things done. Uh, we've done a number of them over the years while we were getting NSS support. Um, so. Originally, we'd had these outreach conferences, and we just turned them into hackathons to, to make the code work better. Getting everybody together in one place made an amazing difference. Um, here's a whole bunch of the people we gathered into the group in this project. Um, most recently, you know, the NSF has decided we're not experimental anymore after supporting us for 20 years, which is fair. So, um, so we're trying to figure out ways to get the minimal amount of money that we need in order to hold a, basically a couple of conferences a year, or small scale ones even. <clears throat> so we want to emphasize that the impact's been substantial. Most educational innovations at the NSF affect only a school, few schools, sometimes only one department. They often die out after a year or two, something like that. We've lasted 23 years. We've got, uh, at a minimum, 776 places using it at one time. We build a coalition of a few dozen programmers contributing new features and refining existing ones, and I would really like to get more. Um, the math people have done a really good job with getting the thing going right for mathematics, but they're not experts at Perl coding, so I'm sure you can come along and say, oh, well, it's good, but we can do this better. Please, that's exactly what we want. Um, the Open Problem Library uh, has an editorial workshop which is curating those problems. Um, over time, I think that WebWork will actually produce the best possible collection of mathematics teaching tools um, because the, it's being done by the teachers who really care about it and they're doing it for their own students. This has to do a little bit with why I wanted to come talk to the Pearl people. So, uh, and I, I have no choice but to quote myself. I was interviewed in 2003 by McCallum about doing web work as a research mathematician, but what that meant, uh, and whether that was the right thing to do. So this is what I said, and I've never been able to say it better, so I'll just quote myself. So the point of it is that, I mean, I think that it was important that the mathematicians got in on this and kind of took the lead. Um, I'm pretty sure that an instructional technology group or even a pure programming group would have designed a system with the same set of strengths and weaknesses. So I think that joining what we've done with things that you guys do, 
we might be able to ameliorate some of those three. So I'm trying to get people to join us. Um, you know, all kinds of coding are useful, but in fact, just the fact that you have been an organizational, people in your organization have been doing organizing and so on for far longer than we did. We were just running NSF grants for a while. We didn't have any ideas about forming a foundation or anything like that. So we can use help on that, on writing, on documentation, all the things that you need to do in Perl, we need to do even more. Um, plus the coding, we can definitely need help with that too. So a couple of specific projects, we could integrate Desmos in on this as well, that's another thing like GeoGebra. Um, I've never quite figured out or found the time to figure out how to make a CPN module for PG, but I think I could, uh, with a little bit of work, we could separate the modules out and put PG up separately on CPAN. I'm not sure the, the, we could do that with a front end, but we could try. Um, the project I'm most involved in right at the moment is getting everything localization, making it work with UTF-8, and um, <clears throat> so it supports Hebrew, Chinese, French, and so on. Technion, uh, we've got a user there that's a big, uh, famous university in, in Israel, um, has taken it over. They, they had their own version of this kind of thing that worked in Hebrew. The guy there looked at it and said it was written in Java. He says, well, if we upgrade this thing, and he finally decided that it would be easier to teach WebWork Hebrew than it would be to fix their Java. And uh, we'd already started on that, and so that's, it's working now as we speak. It's being used there, and it's slowly rolling out to Chinese and French and so on and so forth. What feature would you guys like to add? I went to this Perl 6 talk, uh, you know, the workshop. Uh, there are all kinds of things in Perl 6 that would make this thing kind of neat. Um, one has to be a little bit cautious about that because rolling Perl 6 out to the 770 institutions using it might take a couple of years. So, um, But certainly ideas like that, and it turns out there's all kinds of things in Perl 5 that I didn't know existed as of the, that I learned this morning. So thank you. Questions? Yes? I have a question about uh, how different schools use databases and how wedded to a particular database MySQL setup that you have. Did that cause any problems for adoption? I'm just wondering if uh, universities have been using maybe kind of Oracle or whatever to, to keep creating it and reacting the question. Yes. Uh, so the question is do different schools use different databases and does that cause a problem? Um, that particularly hasn't caused a problem. Um, it is, it's mostly been used with MySQL. I know at least one school that's trying to adapt it to PostSQL, uh, uh, sorry? Postgres. Postgres, I'm sorry, that's what I meant, yeah. Um, and, um, and it was designed, Sam Hathaway designed it so that it was agnostic and so that we could hook it up to a bunch of databases. But until you actually have it working on two or three databases, it's not, uh, completely agnostic. Yes, and so that's been one of the biggest growth, the growth industry right now is high schools and community colleges. Um, surprisingly enough, it's a little bit harder to write problems for high schools than it is for calculus, partially because you actually, you know, when you want the answer, like factor a polynomial, you actually want it in a specific form. And WebWork was originally designed so that anything that was mathematically correct would be okay. So. However, we solved that. Our people at Portland Community College, we've got some, one guy out there who's been doing a lot of work on this thing. Um, and surprisingly, high schools were, there were a few high schools that were early adopters, and now there's a lot more coming along. Um, that is actually one of the growth things. That's also why we need uh, more and better documentation and, um, and simplification. I think we've got it pretty well nailed about making it simple for students to answer the questions and for the computer to stay out of their way and doing their mathematics. But the ability for the, the instructor to write their own problem could still use some work. Now, most of them um, pick the problems from the library. And in many cases, they don't even do that. Some supervisor in the community college does it for them and then they're given these problems. But I'm a big believer in that each instructor really should have a lot of control over what they've done and at least make it possible so that um, 
it's possible now actually to make small modifications easily, but it still looks scary because it, it does look like Perl. <laughs> it looks like programming, anything. Would. But uh, help with that would, be, would also be important. Um, what we've got is something that um, problems, easy problems are relatively easy by our standards. It's, uh, hard problems can be done, which is what's the important thing. Um, what could be done is you could add, say, a JavaScript uh, front end to this whole thing that really is declarative. And so if somebody wants a new problem that's you know, a very standard type, they just fill in a bunch of variables and maybe a function or something like that. And then the, that gets translated into PG and works from there. There have been a couple of attempts to do that, but no one's really followed through. It's, it's, not, it's not that hard to do. People have come close to it. The problem is, is that by the time somebody really wants it, by the time they figured out how to start doing that, they already understand the Perl stuff so well that they don't want it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Same thing with Python. I had, you know, well, just write it in Python. Can't we write it in Python? <laughs> and by within a little while, he didn't care anymore. Yes? Did it, did it ever have terminal support? Yeah. Um, no. In the very early, so WebWork 1, which was uh, on running on Perl 4 on, on CGI, uh, WebWork 2 is a mod Perl type installation, and WebWork 3, I hope, will be a Perl dancer, but, uh, or, or something, whatever else the newest thing. Um, the students never teletyped in. The instructors, however, did. So in the early days, if you wanted to modify a problem or set up a problem set or something like that, you had to have command line access to the, to the web server and, uh, uh, and, and do all that stuff yourself. Part of the stuff that Rob was uh, involved in was changing that so that the instructor interface was also on the web and you could add class lists, add students to the class, assign students to different homework sets, create homework sets. Actually, all of that's Rob's work. Yes. Yeah, another question. Um, how, do you, how do you handle a situation where like, some problems would require mathematical libraries that Perl doesn't have? And so you need the access to, for example, um, the complementary error function or something weird like that. You, know, you, can't, you can't implement that in Perl. Um, um, well, so, well, all right. So when we started this thing, we said, everyone said, oh, how are you going to do this thing without a, a computer? Uh, CAS, you know, computer algebra system. Uh, that includes Chris Sanglin, who thought that was essential. Um, and we said, well, all right, Perl, you know, we'll hook it in when we need to, because Perl can hook in anything. Um, so, um, and then we basically never found a need for that, including what you're mentioning. I think we had all that statistic stuff, was, and an enormous amount of that stuff was already on CPAN, and what wasn't on CPAN we wrote. Um, basically, and you know, huge matrix, mono, uh, well not huge because this is, these are homework problems. I don't have to do industrial strength uh, matrix inversion and things like that, but you know, three by three, five by five matrices, Perl does that just fine. And so we succeeded very well with that. Um, we have hooked it into Sage Math, and I found that useful because even though you could write it in Perl, why you could you know, modular arithmetic and things like that are a little bit easier in Sage. On the other hand, there's at least one guy who just doesn't like being attached to Sage and he's rewriting all the problems that I did and so on using Sage. He's figuring out how to use it with CPAN and custom modules. It's amazing how much mathematics stuff you can do with just straight Perl. Or at least I was, I was impressed. And other people, when you explain it to them carefully, are even more impressed. Other questions? Oh, yes, sir. So how much accessibility and whatnot, uh, can, uh, can, you, can you students use this with something like Link, with a uh, text-only Yes. So this was a very important part. Portland Community College, which I mentioned earlier, um, has I, all schools, but is particularly big on disability. And uh, this last question here. So. Um, we have, it's on, it's on our website, you can kind of, on our wiki page, search for accessibility. We got glowing recommendation from them, way above WebAssign and, and uh, Pearson's My Math Lab and various things like that. 
A lot of that is due to the fact that we use MassJax. And David Servone and his team that, on doing that are very interested in accessibility. Every new version of MassJax that comes out is more accessible than the last. Um, and individual problems might not be accessible because the instructor, the guy who put the pictures on the page forgot to add alt text and so on. That's one of the things we try and catch when we do the um, le editing for the library. I'm afraid that's the last question in public, but I will be glad to, I'll be around through Thursday, and I'll be glad to answer questions. I have cards if you need that. I'm happy to talk to you. Thanks very much for your attention.